Hello, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today's webinar in which we'll be discussing biomarker testing for advanced lung cancer and why it's important. Feel free to put questions in the chat as we'll have time at the end for questions. That's me on the right. My name is Adam Fox. I'm a pulmonologist and clinician scientist at the Medical University of South Carolina. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Bruce Johnson on the left there. He's a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School and institute physician at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where he also serves as the chief clinical research officer and leader of the lung cancer program. He served as the president of ASCO, the Oncology uh, Professional Society, and is an accomplished researcher focusing on the molecular basis of lung cancer and targeted therapeutics for its treatment. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fox. Um, and it's uh, great, great to be here joining you in this, uh, in this webinar. So these are my disclosures. I'd like to point out that I get post-marketing royalties for the EGFR mutation testing, um, which um, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Please keep ordering those tests. I'm going to talk about biomarker testing for advanced lung cancer and why we believe it's uh, important and how it's transformed the care of patients with lung cancer. Um, I've broken it down into four different topics. Uh, the first I'm going to do is talk about the mutations for which there's targeted therapies available that will include EGFR, uh, BRAF, V600E, Medexon 14 skip mutations, uh, some recent uh, advances with the uh, EGFR exon 20, uh, HER2 mutations, and the uh, most recent one, the KRAS G12C. Um, I'll follow that by talking about the chromosomal rearrangements and how they're similar, but yet um, uh, have a bit more of a prolonged efficacy and talk about how those are different. I'll talk about using PDL1 or a program DEF ligand 1 as a, as a biomarker for potential response to immunotherapy and give an example of one of my patients. And then lastly, I want to talk about the testing rates in the United States and uh, what's happened uh, and, and also about the timeliness of getting the testing uh, and that, that influences how um, oncologists and other people caring for these lung cancers uh, end up um, influencing how we take care of people. So first, I want to start, uh, start about where we are. I, I, I began treating people with lung cancer in the 1980s, so I've been at it for a while. And I have to admit, for 20, 30 years, it was a little bit grim. And one of the things I want to show you what it was like two decades ago um, and, and point out a couple of things. Uh, at, this at this period of time, it was sort of hope hopeful that you could rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic and expect a different outcome. And, and this was a study that was in the plenary session, you know, it was considered one of the top four studies done in oncology in 2000 and uh, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in, in, in uh, two, dec two decades ago. And this was giving uh, platinum agents, uh, cisplatin or carboplatin, with uh, four different uh, chemotherapy agents, uh, paclitaxel or taxane, gemcitabine, docetaxel, and paclitaxel. And uh, number one is that it didn't make any difference which of these you gave. But the second thing is, is that uh, the median survival of these patients was eight months. Uh, and these were people that fit a clinical trial. And lastly, the proportion uh, who were alive, this didn't even, the survival curve didn't, uh, the, the axis there, the um, x-axis is uh, months, and they didn't even bother to run the survival curves out to five years. Um, uh, and and in, in these trials at the time, you know, the five-year survival is running out about between two and 5% of the, of the patients with advanced lung cancer. So this is where we started a couple of decades ago. And uh, thank goodness it began to get a little bit better. And one of the things that a lot of us were able to, to do was that at the beginning of the 2000s, um, there were epidermal growth factor receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. There were two that were widely available. The first one that was available was a drug of gefitinib or, or ERISA. And we had expanded access programs. One of the things that people observed is that um, there were a subset of patients who had these rather dramatic responses, uh, typically with chemotherapy, 
the response rates ran at about um, 20%, um, and nobody had a complete response. And if the, the responses lasted a few months. And these are the CT scans of uh, one of the patients who were treated, uh, who was treated at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And uh, the red circles are the bilateral infiltrates. So she had stage four disease, bilateral involvement of her lungs. Um, and uh, she was a person who'd never smoked. Uh, and, um, um, and, and one of the things that she went on the drug gefitinib and had a near uh, complete response for two and a half years. It eventually came back, but this was something we really hadn't seen with any of the other therapeutic agents. Um, and the good thing was uh, this was not terribly complicated in that the drug was uh, aimed at the epidermal growth factor receptor. And the question came up is, is there anything going on in the receptor? And as it turns out, there was. And um, a, a few of us uh, from Harvard Medical School, there was a group at Mass General and then a group of, from uh, Dana-Farber and Brigham who ended up looking at these 13 patients uh, and published it simultaneously in Science and the New England Journal that 13 of the 14 people who had had these responses uh, to gefitinib uh, had a mutation in the tyrosine kinase domain of the epidermal growth factor receptor. And uh, we published this. And, and these two articles uh, have been cited now 25,000 times. So this is something that people took note of. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it was kind of interesting. And it was kind of a simple concept that, that some that, that an agent directed against a receptor that had unusual activity, there must be something going on with the receptor. Uh, one of the things that really facilitated this at the time was that um, this was just at the time when you could begin to sequence um, receptors, uh, se sequence the DNA uh, from paraffin embedded tissues, which is one of the things that enabled us to be able to make this observation. And uh, then we began uh, applying it. And, and one of the other things that happens is that um, although the, the mutations were more frequent than people who'd never smoked than women and people from East Asia, you, you still had to do the test to be able to tell whether they did or did not have the mutation. And this, this shows the um, histology of two patients with adenocarcinoma. The one on your left is one that has an EGFR mutation, and the one on the right is one that has an ALK rearrangement. I'm going to talk about those next. And there's no way you can tell that from taking a look at the morphology. I have to do the test. And, and so far, um, for the EGFR mutation, it's still done by uh, assessing the sequence. With uh, ALK, you can now do an immunohistochemical test. It's a little bit simpler, but um, it, uh, that's a, that one's a chromosomal rearrangement. And I'll talk about that one a little bit in, in a little bit uh, later. So um, one of the things that happened uh, is that, you know, the first agents that were approved uh, were erlotinib uh, and gefitinib. And, um, and can you see my, uh, Dr. Fox, can you see my pointer there? Okay. So when, when this first entered trials, um, you know, the, the, the progression-free survival with chemotherapy, a doublet chemotherapy was about four to six months. And in this group with EGFR mutations, which here in the United States runs at about 10 to 15%, this is the standard EGFR TKI that we had available for us uh, a decade or a decade and a half ago. And as you can see, the progression-free survival is about, um, is about 10 months. And uh, on your right, you can see the survival and the survival is running at about uh, 32 months. So, you know, this is dramatically different than the eight months that I showed you before when you identify this prospectively. And one of the things that's happened with the passage of time, and I'll give you another example when we get to ELK, is that there's an ongoing process of attempting to find more effective drugs. And the sort of general paradigm is that you, you first try, you get the first drug that happens to work, you end up finding out drugs that are effective in the patients who have already progressed and then you move it into the frontline agent. Osimertinib was initially approved for previously treated patients that had the most common form of resistance at T790M. And when you move it into the frontline, it, it increases it by 8.9 months or almost doubling the length of time the drug works. And, and this is what we've been able to do uh, in these uh, genomically defined subsets is, you know, you find a drug that works pretty well. And then 
Uh, once you define the mechanisms of resistance, you develop a drug that is more effective, and then it turns out it works a bit longer. And then with longer follow-up, um, two years later, they publish the survival of this and shows that the patients um, who were treated with, as I mentioned before, were treated the, the first generation inhibitor, the gefitinib or lotinib, uh, ended up being about 32 months, while it was about uh, 39 months for the patients with osimertinib or about seven months longer. And we hope to continue going through these paradigms. The other thing that, um, that, that happens is that um, you know, all mutations are not the same. I'll, I'll make a comment about that with the exon 20 mutations. But um, in this particular one, it turns out it makes a difference about whether it's one of the two most common mutations. The two most common mutations are the ones that were described in those, that first article. One is a, a, a mutation that has a single amino acid change, an L858R mutation in the tyrosine kinase domain. And then there's a exon 19 deletion mutation that takes out four or more amino acids, and it activates both, and you can make a drug that uh, gets uh, is more active against both. But one of the things that happens, it turns out it makes a difference whether you have that exon 19 deletion or whether you have the L858R mutation. So you, not only do you know, need to know whether it's mutated or not, you need to know which specific mutation it is. Because when you take a look at this, of uh, the osimertinib compared to the standard, here in blue, you know, when you take a look out at the 51, this is going out over a good bit over three years uh, in the survival. Uh, and, and when you take a look at the, um, at the comparator, the, the standard one, as we would expect, uh, this one's right at around um, 32 months that we would expect. Now, with the L858R, you can see these things are virtually superimposed. So the drug only works better in, in the uh, exon 19 deletion mutants. And here, if you follow this out to about the 50 point, this thing is working for about two and a half years. So, um, and, and one of the things that currently happens and, and the research group I work with uh, is trying to come up with a better drug for the L850R mutants. Uh, and hopefully you can see this same kind of prolongation with what we would think of then as a, uh, as a fourth generation inhibitor. So the general paradigm is that, you know, you, you figure out these subsets, you figure out the mechanism resistance, you redesign the drugs, and uh, as, as an ever the optimist, we anticipate the drugs will get better and better. And as they get more specific for the mutant form, they also carry fewer side effects. You know, we had, we had a lot of people that couldn't make it through in the first generation inhibitors because of skin rash and diarrhea, the principal. Um, but one of the things, because these drugs are relatively specific for the mutant form, we just don't see the frequency of, of, of skin rash and diarrhea. They're spared of most of the side effects. Well, it turns out that, you know, this is effective in advanced disease. And, and, you know, I showed you, we started out with chemotherapy treated patients with median survivals of about 10 months. And we are, we're going out to about three years or more in the age of our mutants that are treated. But what about if you put this in earlier stage disease? I know we, you know, the title of this is, is taking a look at people with advanced disease, but it turns out it's becoming important in patients with earlier stage disease. And the effect is even greater. So one of the things that happened, and this is a study uh, that took a look at patients with stages, the study was for 1B through 3s, but this, this subset is the stage 2s and 3s uh, who were studied for having one of the sensitized mutations of the epidermal growth factor receptor, the L858R mutation or the exon 19, and they were given up to three years of adjuvant therapy. Now, there's two things about giving three years of adjuvant therapy. Number one is, you know, it's kind of long, but we've gotten used to it in breast cancer where women will take five years of hormonal therapy. But the other important thing is the drug is designed so that people can tolerate taking it for three years. You know, the, the, previous, the previous iteration of this where the drug was less specific for the mutant form and had more effects on the, on the normal is you had problems with skin rash and diarrhea. And there were a lot of dose reductions and a lot of the patients couldn't finish it. So here you can see, and this is something we don't see very often in cancer. Um, uh, the top one is the disease-free survival, taking a look at when the patients relapse. Um, and as you can see, the, the median duration uh, of the drug intervention trial is about 66 months, 65.8 months. And the placebo in this group is uh, 22 months. So, you know, 
two Bs and threes are sort of early, um, but you know you can see the, this group of patients, the vast majority of them are gonna die, relapse and die of their cancer. Uh, but this is a hazard ratio. It reduces the chances of it recurring by, uh, by 77%, which is something we really, th th this really is unusual in cancer and that you can cut down the chances of recurring by 77%. They've not yet published the survival on this yet. Um, this, was, this was an update uh, that I pulled. It's from last month uh, where they showed the update in these uh, survival curves. The, the other thing about um, the generation inhibitors, and, and one of the things that we're seeing now that these patients are living years instead of months, is that um, you worry about whether they're going to get brain metastasis. Um, you know, one of the things that's very difficult to treat in oncology, if it goes into the brain, it's for two reasons. One is you're limited on, you know, what you can and can't resect. Um, um, and if you do resect it, it, it it's difficult to... Uh, get a complete resection. You, obviously, you can't take margins and such. Uh, the second is um, making sure that drugs can get into the brain. You know, a lot of, especially the chemotherapy drugs never got into the brain very well. And with a lot of mediphytinib, they didn't get in that well, th th that terribly well either. Um, and, but one of the things when they, when they've taken a look at this and take a look, this is a central nervous system disease-free survival. So, 100% would mean that nobody's going to recur in the brain, and zero it means everybody's going to recur. And as you can see here, the vast majority of people have not recurred in the brain. So the drug is the drug is both controlling the systemic disease as well as preventing the recurrence uh, in the brain, which is a one area, as I mentioned before, that's particularly difficult to treat. And as you can see, this is a, a potential common site of relapse with up to a quarter of the patients uh, developing brain mets uh, by four years out if they're on the older uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, as if, they're, uh, if they're just observed. So here you can see um, you cut it down by about 15%, uh, which is a big help. So this was approved by the FDA uh, three years. When, when the data was first released, this was a study that was stopped early because of the magnitude of benefit and the patients were allowed to cross over to commercial drug supply on this. So uh, some of the patients <clears throat> got put on, the, put on the drug and they're still uh, seeing this vast uh, difference in outcome. So we await the, the survival data, but you know, certainly my patients who have stage two or three A, I certainly uh, wanna put on the uh, osimertinib. So it's very important to discover these, not only in advanced disease, but also in earlier stage disease as well. Well, you know, um, the EGFR mutations um, uh, were, were approved uh, for doing it in 2013. Uh, it's gotten, from testing one uh, at, uh, a decade ago, um, there's now uh, 10, uh, 10 or 11 different changes for which one should be tested for which there's FDA approved indications. And you know, I, I put osimertinib in here. There's a, quite a few others um, that are approved, but I haven't listed them uh, all here because uh, osimertinib is clearly the drug of choice for, for these patients. And you can see, um, and we're, we, as we go down here, V600Es, you know, this is approved in um, melanoma and, and it was approved in 2017. Medex and, and Medex on 14, it's got uh, two different drugs approved, capmatinib and um, tapotinib. And, and as you can see, the response durations and the progression-free survivals are running, you know, typically, you know, between 10 and 11 months. Uh, for Exxon 20, it's one that's not sensitive. Uh, that particular mutation is not sensitive to the drugs that I showed you, but it turns out they've developed uh, two different drugs that work uh, about 40% of the time. Now, granted, you know, this is about the same or about so somewhere between the same to uh, twice as active as what you'd seen with conventional chemotherapy in these populations. And the Exxon 20s, the duration of response, 10 to 14 months, progression-free survival of eight months. Trastuzumab, Durexatecan, response rate of 58%, once again, in this uh, area that's between eight and 12 months. And uh, Probably most importantly, you know, 
Uh, BRAF runs at about 1% of lung cancer. Exxon 14 is about you know, 2 to 3. Um, Exxon 20 is, is relatively rare. ERB2 is about 2 or 3%. Uh, KRAS G12C is about 12% of adenocarcinomas of the lung. So this one's pretty, pretty clear. And as you can see, the response rates are about 20%, duration response 9 to 11 and seven months. So um, it's important to identify all these. They, you can't tell them apart by any clinical indications. All of these, with the exception of the KRAS G12C, are ones found more commonly in people who have never smoked. Uh, KRAS G12C is the one uh, is the one that's associated with smoking. And you'll also see BRAP B600E occurs in some of the people who have smoked in the past. And I'll mention why that's a bit important when we get to the immunotherapy section. So I've talked about the different point mutations for which is targeted therapies. I, I, um, I will go through these four different um, chromosomal rearrangements briefly and uh, talk about them. Um, and uh, I'm going to, as I did in the previous one, I'm going to, uh, where I focused on EGFR, I'm going to focus on ALK or anaplastic lymphoma kinase. And I thought I'd show you one of my patients. Um, this was, this was kind of an interesting person. She was um, a lady who was in Germany and showed up with brain mets in the summer of 2011. And um, they resected the brain mets. Um, you know, she had a she had a single side of mets, and they empirically started her on an EGFR regimen because she hadn't smoked. And um, you know, the whole point of this is that you, you can't tell these on clinical characteristics. You got to do the test. So, and it wasn't going well. Um, she didn't respond to the EGFR inhibitor. They tried to give her chemo. And she, just, she was originally from the U.S., and she decided the best way to go see the doctor was to get on an airplane. So she came here to the Boston area. Uh, she ended up finding out she had an ALK rearrangement. Uh, at 2011 was um, about the time we were doing the trials for uh, crizotinib for uh, ELK. She got put on, um, this is her lesion here uh, on the right side. And as I mentioned, she also had a brain met. And we put her on crizotinib for four years. And she progressed, and uh, it, it was four years later. So we'd come up with a new drug, um, electinib, uh, which is the agent of choice for uh, newly diagnosed patients. And uh, she's still going in March of 2023. Uh, she's lived. Her kids were in junior high when all this started, and uh, she or they've all finished grad school. Uh, they haven't gotten married yet. She doesn't have grandkids, but. Uh, she's gotten a decade out of it and still going, uh, still going pretty strong and she lives a pretty normal life. So this is, you know, uh, and, and I, you know, I showed you the, how well things work. This one so far is the one that uh, is one where you see these very long and, and very sustained uh, responses, particularly to the third generation inhibitors. And just to show you how, how this works, this was the study that, that showed that where they compared the, this third generation inhibitor electinib to the first drug that was active was crizotinib. And once again, here I put in red, uh, they're able to do this just on an immunohistochemical test, not having to do the genomic test and uh, put her on. And, and this, they put about 150 patients on each one. And the primary endpoint was progression free survival. And th these are the progression free survival curves. Once again, you know, as expected, you get that sort of 11-month progression-free survival with the first-generation inhibitor. And here we get a specific, uh, relatively specific uh, inhibitor that's potent that was specifically developed against the ALK rearrangement. It works for almost three years. Um, and, you know, in our, in our world where we started out with, uh, with about three or four months, this is, uh, this is quite a change. And uh, this is followed up uh, five years after the trial started. And this is a survival. Now, uh, about two thirds of the patients crossed over. Uh, so you don't, you don't see a huge difference. And these patients are do, doing pretty well. And this is one where the majority of people are living longer than five years. So, you know, I, I love to show this one because being a person who was around uh, treating people uh, where we had, uh, 
you know, when I first got in the business, uh, we were having between two and 5% of people alive at five years. And we didn't bother to run the survival curves out to beyond, uh, beyond three and a half years. This is quite a, this is a, quite a change uh, and being able to do this. Now, granted, this is only one to 3%, but, you know, when you lump all these things together, we're getting, you know, somewhere around about 30 or 40% of the people are going to have one of these drivers for which you can give these targeted agents that, and, and a good number of them have a rather substantial impact on the patient's outcome. And the part you don't see is that people can be on these treatments for years uh, and function pretty normally. So these are the rearrangements that I wanted to show you, the ELK, the MTREC, and RET. Um, the thing about the chromosomal rearrangements is the tyrosine kinase domain remains intact. These, by and large, these are not uh, agents that are terribly active uh, normally. So you can give relatively potent and specific inhibitors. So as I showed you before, the progression-free survival of lectinib is about 35 months, close to three years. NTREC is a rare one. It's less than a percent lung cancer. ALK is about three to 5%. percent. And as you can see, the progression-free survivals are running between 11 and 28 months. And then RET, there's two different agents that are approved, as well as two agents for NTREC. And the progression-free survival is running about a year and a half. So this is pretty good that we're, we await the mature survival. And as you can see, the response rates, uh, if they have these rearrangements, run at about, on average, about 70%. The duration of survival, the duration of response running at about two and a half years and progression-free survival at about two years. So um, the, the, when you find these things and you get, give them the drugs, they work pretty well. So what about, what about the other biomarker? PD-L1, it's programmed F ligand one. Um, it, some, of the, some of the checkpoint inhibitors, a class of the immunotherapy agents, uh, call for having 1% uh, or higher um, to be able to treat. And others, you don't have to test. And um, it, it is actually somewhat of a confusing field because a lot of use different points, the, the, you know, as far as far as getting the test, you just have to order the test. The medical oncologist can sort out, um, you know, what, what that means and what the treatment indications are. But the thing I want to point out is the, is, is pd one greater than 50%. So that represents about a quarter to a third of lung cancer. Um, now, one of the things about pd one it's a little bit opposite the ones that I've already talked about. Most of these um, mutations or chromosomal rearrangements occur in patients who haven't smoked very much. pd one tends to be higher in the cigarette smokers. So there's some, it's getting me close to something for everyone. And when I see the patients in clinic, I tell them this is one time that, this is one of the few times where it's good to have smoked because if you're going to get immunotherapy, the more you smoke, the more likely the drugs are going to work. So uh, there's going to be, as I said before, there's going to be something for everyone. I'll show you some of uh, some of what happens with uh, the people based on on that PDL one testing. Once again, it's about a third of patients who are going to have this value, and it's an immunohistochemical test, so it's relatively simple to uh, to carry out. Now, I'll show you some stuff on the testing rates that show you. Um, this one seems to be a lot. The, the uptake on getting this test is a bit quicker than some of the other tests. So once again, um, this is one of my, another one of my patients. The guy was, um, this gentleman was, about, was in his middle 80s when I first met him. He was on oxygen in the hospital. And, um, uh, and I saw him, and, and this is what his CT scan looked like, because this is, he had involvement of the right upper lobe. And but by extensive bilateral involvement, and uh, he ended up getting up to ten liters of oxygen, to keep him going. And um, I gave him single agent, um, a single agent um, checkpoint inhibitor, and he had a complete response. Um, and I took him off therapy after two years. Um, that's something also I thought I'd never see. Uh, now he's one of the about about a third to a half of the people who get two years of therapy, look like they have a complete response, um, are gonna recur. He recurred about uh, nine or 10 months later. Um, this particular, the first time I gave him a checkpoint inhibitor alone, 
the second this the second time uh, when he didn't respond, I uh, gave him chemotherapy plus a checkpoint inhibitor. Now, interestingly, you know the chemotherapy we give now. At the time when I started, he was 88, uh, uh, and he tolerated it fine. Um, and um, I've had him on immunotherapy. And it looks like um, we're going to try to take him off the therapy in another few months to see how he does again. And when I saw him back this month, he's still he still doesn't have any evidence of disease. So, um, and and the the interesting thing, he's got some problems of back pain and things, but, you know, you make it to be 90, some, something's going to give. So uh, n- not only does this work, but you can give it to people. Um, you know, we, we used to exclude people from the clinical trials who were older than 65. And now you can treat uh, the treatments. Uh, people can tolerate this up in, up to the, up into the nineties, which is I age is becoming more important. So. So what does the trial show in this? And, and remember, I told you about 2 to 5% of people were alive at five years when we had the first rounds of, of doublet chemotherapy. So this was the, this was the trial that um, showed this, this happened. And it was uh, one of the checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab um, versus uh, chemotherapy in those that had a pdl one of greater than uh, 50%. And this is the... Um, these are the survival curve. This is the survival curve. As you can see, it's a 40% reduction in the chances of death. And as they followed people, you can see here about 32% of the patients were alive at five years as opposed to 16%. Now, it turns out, once again, about um, a half to two thirds of the people crossed over. Um, uh, so not, not only is it important to get the immunotherapy, it's important to get it early in the treatment course which means you need to have the testing to be able to identify these people. Now, one of the, one of the things that's sort of confusing uh, for, for, for those of us medical oncologists that have to keep this straight is that different of the checkpoint inhibitors have different cut points for you know, where you give this, but, and, and it's for drug approvals. But you know, in, in truth, it's, it's, not a, it's not a dichotomous variable, it's a linear variable. So, um, this is from uh, my, our, my colleagues here at Dana-Farber who took a look at the progression-free survival. And um, when people were treated with pembrolizumab who had pdl one values of greater than 50%, and they broke it down into two areas. Uh, one is those that had it between 50 to 89% versus 90 to 100%. 90 to 100% makes up you know, about, about 10 to 20% uh, of the patients. And here they've broken it, and the blue line is the patients who have 90 to 100%, which is, you know, roughly, it's a little bit less than half, and those that have between 50 and 89%. And as you can see, um, the hazard ratio of of progression-free survival is 0.5, where, you know, you essentially double the progression-free survival in the patients (coughs) who have the values between 90 to 100%. And when you take a look at survival, obviously it's not reached versus 16 months. So, so rather than thinking about this as you know, um, 50% or greater, is that and I use this is that the higher the PDL1 value, the more likely I am to give these patients a single agent uh, checkpoint inhibitor. So this is kind of the focus of this talk um, about biomarker testing for advanced lung cancer and why it's important is that not everybody's getting it. So I, I want to show you three different studies that have looked at this, um, and uh, including some that I've worked on. So the first thing I, I want to, this is a little bit wordy, but you take a look at our uh, the thing that a lot of us go by, and it, it, the short for this is NCCN, which more people may know this as uh, compared to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Um, and, and one of the things that happened, I, I've shown you there's, um, you know, there's 12 different markers for which there's FDA approved agents and there's more coming all the time. And one of the things you don't wanna have to do is go back and retest every time there's a new drug that's approved. So um, in, in the guidelines that we use for, uh, for the cancer uh, evaluation and treatment, 
is these uh, NCCN guidelines. And they're pretty similar with a number of different professional societies. But it's recommended that uh, when feasible, testing should be formed by a broad panel-based approach, most typically by a next generation sequencing. And uh, for patients in the testing who don't have an identifiable driver, um, you can consider these RNA-based um, NGS um, if it's not already be performed. Um, for some of these chromosomal rearrangements, it's tough to do. And some of the commercial providers uh, automatically go to an RNA-based NGS, uh, which is a better way of detecting the chromosomal rearrangements. So I showed you the chromosomal rearrangements. You know, some of the drugs work particularly well uh, in there compared to the uh, mutations. And that uh, the broad molecular testing is defined as molecular testing that identifies all biomarkers. This is just the ones where they're all the FDA um, and, and also the emerging biomarkers. So, so what, I what I was talking about is that, you know, I showed you, um, and I didn't show you the pace at which they're happening, but right now there's uh, between one to two different genomic markers every year for which uh, there's uh, new agents that are approved. And so, you, as I said before, you don't want to have to go back and test. So you hope that um, the panels that the commercial providers, as well as maybe your own homegrown ones, have not only all the ones for which there's FDA approved agents, but also the ones that are likely to emerge in the next several years, that are going to have an impact on uh, being able to select the therapies. So, um, what I want to show you is um, this was one that was done in the uh, U.S. Oncology. Uh, so they looked at the biomarker testing among the metastatic non-small cell lung cancers, getting first-line treatment in the U.S. Oncology Network. And there were uh, patients, non-small cell lung cancer patients, initiating first-line systemic treatment between April 1st of 2018 um, through March of 2020. Now, at the time, there were uh, five um, biomarkers for which there are FDA approved agents, and that's EGFR, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, and PDL1. So, uh, within the US Oncology Network, they had 3,474 with advanced non small cells, 74% adenocarcinoma lung. Most of them had a good ECOG performance status, so it was a group that was important to know this. 90% of them had at least one biomarker, but only 46% of them got all five biomarker tests uh, that we were talking about, for which there were FDA approved agents during the timeframe that they examined them with a one year lag, all of them improved for at least a year. And these are the rates. Now, the part that's interesting interests me here is that, you know, they're running at about uh, typically in, in, in the seventies or eighties. Um, the uptake of the PDL one is a bit higher in the eighties, but these three uh, all had approved indications uh, at the time they looked for eight years or longer. BRAF was approved in 2017. So um, it was a year before. Um, and, and, and so the uptake is okay, I guess, um, but it's not, it's, not incredibly, um, it's not incredibly high, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, one of, the, one of the things that happened and, and um, Dr. Fox's boss um, and I worked uh, on this uh, and that we did one that was similar to what was done with the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary physicians. And that is take a look at the biomarker related testing and treatment practices for advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And it was done by surveys. The, the one I showed you before was actually taking a look at the patient records uh, to show it was actually done. So we, we sent a, a survey to 2,374 patients uh, or physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs who are members of ASCO. 49% um, or about half are lung cancer specialists. I was one of those. I filled it out. So, um, uh, and, and so I, I, I knew what it was like. I didn't know for sure that I was going to be working on it when I um, filled it out. Um, it was available for several months and 170,000, I'm sorry, 170 uh, responses were seen or 7%. So, I think one of the things it shows is ASCO, phys ASCO physicians and healthcare providers aren't very good at filling out surveys because these are all people that agreed to be contacted um, and, and they're um, eligible for analysis. And the thing I wanted to show you here is a little bit different than the others because it asks how long you're willing to wait. So this is the, um, the average wait time for uh, getting the biomarker testing and uh, eight 
um, five, eight of them or 5% wanted it within a week. Um, the majority of them wanted it within two weeks. Not a few people were waiting to wait, wait three or four weeks. Interestingly, the older a person was, the more likely they were uh, willing to wait uh, to get the results uh, for, before embarking on treatment. And then the last one I want to show you is, you know, this one shows what happens with the passage of time. So this is a flat iron EHR. Uh, they looked at 30,631 uh, patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer from 280 U.S. cancer clinics. And they identified patients between January of 2015 and July of 2021 who initiated treatment. And the records were examined for EG, ELK, EGFR, ROS1, KRAS, BRAF, and PDL1. Um, KRAS didn't have an approved um, medication for it until uh, two uh, until two years ago, and BRAF was in 2016. So, but all the others uh, were available by 2015. So, this takes a, a look at the uptake in these 30,000 patients with the passage of six years. And this is what this is what it looks like um, now. Um, the, the, one, the one that I'd like to point out is one that changed it quite a bit, uh, and that is, uh, this one is the one for ELK. So you can see this one, there wasn't much uptake, but um, by 2016, um, there was an indication that you had to have a PDL one of 1% or higher to get treated with a checkpoint inhibitor, and then that 50% came in. So it looks like about 70% of the patients got it, and it doesn't change very much between 2017 to 21. Um, the top one is uh, EGF, um, is uh, any of the above, uh, but the, and the others, the green one, EGFR, was the first one. It hasn't changed a great bit. And then when you take a look as these new ones are, are either being studied or indicated, it takes a long time uh, for, for these to be uptake. And as you can see, the bottom line where all of the above, only 40% of the patients uh, get tested for all of them. So I you know, the thing I take from this is that we, we could do a good bit better. So I've talked about, you know, all these different mutations for which there's agents I've, uh, and, and the difference it makes in doing them um, for the mutations. You know, you can expect a patient with EGFR mutant lung cancer to live about four years. And, and this is the first one where we've seen uh, efficacy in the adjuvant setting. Um, the chromosomal rearrangements, these um, the drugs tend to work better in this, uh, particularly the ELK is very mature now, and we're seeing effective agents that work for about three years. The PDL1 testing, um, and it's something I thought I wouldn't see, and that is, is that there's a certain proportion of patients who appear to be cured of their uh, non small cell lung cancer that are surviving free of cancer for over um, five years from the stop, stop in the checkpoint inhibitor. And the testing rate still can be a bit better in the US, uh, even in in the oncology populations, and that uh, we would hope that as uh, new agents are introduced, that the testing rates for those specific genes increases, uh, and that we also hope that we can get these results in sometimes, sometimes uh, in two weeks or less uh, for getting these all from our uh, broad panel of tests. So with that, I'd like to thank you for the attention and uh, open it up for questions. Uh, and, and please, everyone, please uh, put your questions. Uh, there's a QA and uh, a in, in the Zoom to put your questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that excellent talk. Uh, I wanted to reflect on a couple spots while we while we look through any questions we may, we may get here. Um, one of the big uh, points I think was illustrated uh, by some of the patients that you, you brought to this talk was that the toxicity uh, seems to be much lower for some of these agents compared to that traditional chemotherapy. Can you speak to some of the, uh, the toxicity uh, that you may see compared to standard chemotherapy and, and who may be eligible for these patients who may not be eligible for maybe traditional chemotherapy? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things that, that happened is that um, up until about 15 years ago, uh, we stopped the therapy after six courses of treatment. And about uh, the, the median number of, of cycles that our patients could tolerate was three to four. So, um, and, and they, when they added bevacizumab, 
uh, to the Rajavans, it was the first time in a trial that we ended up seeing that the majority of people got all six cycles of therapy. So uh, it was tough to make it through uh, through those agents. And um, as a person, you know, it, it, and it, the people looked like they were getting chemotherapy. You know, they had, they, they, they had hair loss, uh, nausea and vomiting, fatigue. Um, the finally, uh, when the drug Pemetrexid came out, uh, one of the nucleoside analogs, that was the first drug that you could give for longer than the four to six cycles. And there was a maintenance therapy study where it made people live a bit longer. And the median number you could give in that setting, you know, was somewhere around 10 to 10 to 16 doses. So, you, so, so it was a, a median. Uh, so the median went up a bit. But other than that, the standards, you know, the taxines that they still use in breast cancer, people have a tough time taking those for a long period of time. Um, as I mentioned to you before, um, you know, granted these targeted agents, particularly the first generation ones, will have a quite a bit of toxicity. So when we first used gefitinib and berlotinib, there were serious problems with skin rash and diarrhea, prompting a lot of dose reductions. And we, we used to have a special group that helped manage the, the skin side effects. And you got this bad acneiform rash on your shoulders and face. People could tell you're getting treated. Um, and the, the drug uh, osimertinib, uh, they ended up engineering it. So it was more preferential against um, preferentially active uh, in, in the mutant form and, and it spared the skin. And so it was less. There's a, there, the others, um, you know, an electinib is pretty easy. It's, it, 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 interestingly, it affects the light dark adaptation um, on this, and it also causes a bit of GI distress. There's some, like for instance, selpercatinib, the one for ret rearrangements, uh, it can cause hypertension. Uh, it causes hypertension and, and diarrhea, and you know, you end up having to manage hypertension. But frankly, I'd rather manage the hypertension than the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and hair loss. So, and, and the one thing that does happen is that these have enough side effects, they'll keep the oncologists in business because nobody wants to try to remember all the side effects and how you manage these things. So, um, uh, and, I've, and, you know, the other thing that happens is, you know, I, you don't see these people all the time. I got my second person with a RET rearrangement that I'm getting ready to start on treatment. You don't see them every day. And, and, and it took a while to figure out that they get hypertension that you have to have to manage through this. Uh, that, that's uh, incredibly interesting and insightful. Um, one of the other things um, that came up that I thought was really interesting was uh, the focus on biomarker testing for patients uh, who have smoked. That's always been a kind of a controversial topic for the last 10 to 15 years of the importance of biomarker testing for those who've smoked. And um I think that, that that the cases you brought, especially with uh, uh, perhaps that patient who got immunotherapy, who had the exceedingly high pd one score, was I think incredibly insightful and, and hopefully a really good illustration for that concept. Uh, the, the, the one the, the the one thing that does happen, uh, as I mentioned before, you know these EGFR mutations and ALK arrangements, um, you know they tend to be more common. That said, they are found in people who smoke, and and you can't so that like. Um, all of our, all the professional societies who have weighed in uh, have said you shouldn't use clinical characteristics for deciding on biomarker testing. It's just that they're less frequent, but the people who have these uh, have these genomic changes that could occur in uh, almost anybody. And, you know, we find these in people who have smoked in the past. But also, as you correctly mentioned, you know, you want to know the PDL1 values. Uh, it, it turns out that, you know, they're, they're bo both things are true. Number one is that the people who haven't smoked very much, who have these um, targeted therapies that can get the, typically they're getting pills uh, instead of chemo that work quite a bit longer. But also in here, this group, because they typically haven't smoked very much, the immunotherapy doesn't work very well. So you really have to have the test for two reasons. One is so they get the targeted therapy. But the second is you don't want to put them on the immunotherapy because they don't work. So for instance, you know, with this RET rearrangement, um, I had a, the guy, a, a guy I put on study, it only worked for about six months and he had to get irradiated. So it didn't work for him. 
and I put him on immunotherapy and uh, he, he ended up having a complete response. I took him off and he recurred after seven months. I want to put him back on the red inhibitor because I'm worried that the immunotherapy is not going to work as well uh, in this setting. So uh, please don't use the clinical characteristics because there is a subset of people where these will work um, uh, even uh, in the, in the smoking folks. So. And, and I think even the, the, the decision-making that you just illustrated for us with that last patient really speaks to, um, and to how important it is uh, at the time of diagnosis to really make sure that these biomarkers are being assessed for, because uh, myself, I, you know, I participate in our multi-D, uh, multidisciplinary tumor board weekly. And this is, I mean, this is the topic for every patient with non-small cell lung cancer is what are their biomarkers? What were the what, what was the pattern that we saw and what has been the response uh, to therapy? Uh, it, it really weighs in the decision-making, it seems like. Now, I mean, uh, just this week, uh, I had a guy who, um, he, he ended up getting a relatively small biopsy. They sent it off to a commercial provider and um, there wasn't enough to do the testing. And so then they told, you know, we got the message that, they're having to recut, uh, recut the uh, bronco, bronchoscopic biopsies to try to get enough to do the genomic testing. I was worried that we would not be able to find out um, what, what he had. So I repeated a percutaneous biopsy on him to get make sure we had enough uh, adequate amounts of tumor tissue to be, do the testing. And then um, I was lining him up to, uh, he had smoked in the past and he had a pretty good pdl one value. So I was lining him up to get uh, a, a novel immunotherapy regimen. And then uh, after I was near done with the screening, the testing came back, they had a RET rearrangement. So and knowing that the RET rearrangement, say we only got a 6% response rate to the immunotherapy. So I switched them over to, um, to the, to the uh, targeted therapy cohort instead of the immunotherapy. And uh, there's, also, uh, there's also some evidence about uh, getting both increasing likelihood of complications such as pneumonitis and things like that. Is that correct? And so I see there's a question in the chat about what's the likelihood of pulmonary fibrosis. So mm. um, almost all the agents that we have uh, cause, uh, cause pulmonary fibrosis. You know, the, the, the one thing that happens because we image, you know, typically for people on, um, on the targeted therapies, we uh, image them every a couple of months. Um, so even people with um, people who have, are asymptomatic will end up seeing if they're developing interstitial infiltrates and um, they're pretty characteristic. Uh, and, you know, the ones that, you know, the targeted therapies, you know, for instance, um, gefitinib, merlotinib and, and osimertinib, you know, they, they run, you know, interstitial lung disease ran at a rate of about uh, one to two percent in the U.S. and 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 three to five percent in in patients who are uh, of Asian descent, and it held up the it held up the um, adjuvant therapy studies for a long time. Um, with asimertinib, there's less of it, and so that it was able to be put into the adjuvant treatment. Um, but in and the the part about those is that it's pretty easy to treat. You just drop the drug, and then um, put them on steroids. Uh, the one that's a tougher to treat is the uh, pulmonary fibrosis or the interstitial infiltrates you get from the checkpoint inhibitors. Um, they they tend to go on much longer than the radiation, the um, the pneumonitis that we see with combined modality. And you know you typically have to treat them for months. I have a lady right now that's coming off of uh, having gotten um, having gotten in uh, the the bilateral infiltrates associated with the checkpoint inhibitor. And uh, sh I've just got her tapered off after about a month and a half uh, of it, and she's doing okay. So um, so these are something we commonly see. Uh, the one thing I always do in anybody that gets new, gets pneumonitis associated with a tox is I have them see one of my pulmonary colleagues to help uh, in case they need to be uh, biopsied. 
To follow up on the second part of that, other question about early stage disease, the role for these therapies, you know, that it seems like there's evidence for EGFR <laughs> and for immunotherapy in early stage and resectable uh, lung cancer. Do you see the roles for these other targeted therapies expanding into early stage as well? Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're started now. I mean, uh, uh, the elk, the one thing is these are really in the rare ones, you know, elk, so uh, one to 3% in the rare ones, they're pretty tough. Uh, to get enough patients to be able to <clears throat> answer the questions. Mm. So um, now the, the one thing is about, uh, about looking at drugs in earlier stage disease, uh, you know, there's drug approvals for uh, with, uh, with atezolizumab in the, as well as pembrolizumab in the adjuvant setting, um, not in one A's, but typically they start at one B's uh, at the current time um, uh, for it. So, um, you know, the, the, so there's approvals both for EGFR inhibitors as well as for um, checkpoint inhibitors in, in early, at uh, 1Bs and higher. Um, the other question that came through about thoughts of single agent immunotherapy of pd negatives who don't have any actual um, mutations, we don't, um, um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, Pembro- Merck, who makes pembrolizumab, um, st- stacked the deck a little bit and got rid of the bottom third of the patients with the PDL one of zero and, and did them on one percent and and there's approvals for tezolizumab with one percent or higher and um, uh, and and it took fewer patients to do the trials. Bristol-Myers Squibb that makes nivolumab always wanted to get a broad indication and so they included people with PDL one negative. Um, in general, you know, as far as a single agent immunotherapy, we don't give um, most of our patients um, get chemotherapy plus immunotherapy based on the trials. They do a bit. They do a bit better um, in that setting. Um, the the um, the only people I give for me personally, the only people I give single agent immunotherapy to are the people who have typically have very high levels and have some sort of medical contraindication where I'm not real enthusiastic about giving the chemotherapy. If I think they can tolerate the chemotherapy and immunotherapy, I'm more likely to, to treat them with, with, with it. I think that's uh, all the questions we've had. We're, we're rounding up to about uh, four o'clock here. Um, so I, I'd certainly want to thank uh, Dr. Johnson for a, a really great talk. Um, really really took took a lot of the main points around biomarker testing uh, and, and really some great illustrative points around some of these patients who can gain a lot of benefit. Uh, I'd like to thank Chest and the, and the, the uh, organizers from Chest for helping us put this together. And um, we do have uh, two more uh, webinars in the series, one on tissue acquisition and also one on uh, multidisciplinary coordination and issues related to pathology. <clears throat> Uh, so we'll be looking forward to those uh, in the next uh, month here. Um, thanks, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fox, and uh, my thanks to the audience and the folks who posed the questions. <laughs>